hear about Frank Chester and the work that he's been doing for 17 years um, and some of the many, many discoveries that have come from that work. I also just want to talk about the other side of Frank's work. So there is the applied science side that would not have come about if it were not for the creative artistic. Really, the more you spend time with Frank, his process, his work, you see that there is no, there's no real boundary between science and art. These things go together. And that's one of the really kind of profoundly exciting things that I think you, people feel from this, even if they don't quite follow it all. Um, they know that there is some objectivity and rigor and truth to what is taking place there. And there's also just this amazing alive creativity. So we're gonna, we're gonna see some of the um, applied scientific discoveries that have come from Frank's work. And, um, and I just wanted to bring up a couple other opportunities to spend time with Frank, including tonight at nine to 11, after the main program in the, um, the ballroom there's going to be a social space. You've probably seen a lot of Frank's artistic work is lining the back of the hall. So Frank and or some of his posse crew that travel along with him are going to be there and we'd love to talk with you about the art. Everything is for sale. It's certainly not, there's no dangling tacky price tags on anything, but we, it is looking to connect with people. It is looking for a home and it's looking for support to continue the work. So um, there are some of these catalogs that were made up for um, an exhibition a while ago. Frank does a lot. He makes a lot. There's a lot of work and it's beautiful both for people's homes but also really for organizations. Some of the most profoundly kind of touching things that I've seen have been in Waldorf schools or outside of a Camp Hill to see his bells that can really just bring a lot to a community. So that's my plug for that. In the morning at 10, Frank is also signing his book um, and that's in the, the ballroom as well. I think that's it, so Frank Chester. Well, thank you for being here. I don't know how long I'll talk, but the main thing I want to encourage you to, to uh, think of this as your research, too. <clears throat> like I've been doing this 17 years, and I discovered this. You can hear me in the back? Yeah. I'll talk a little louder. Just raise your hand once in a while in the back to tell them, and I'll, I'll, that'll mean I need to talk loud. If I forget. Um, <clears throat> I discovered what you're going to see 15 years ago. A little over 15 years ago. But I never let anybody see it. I kept it. <clears throat> and. Um, about two years after I discovered it, um, I made, a, I made a, a working device of it, which I also kept secret. I kept it to myself. I didn't tell anybody. <clears throat> so 10 years after that, I just started to think that maybe I should let this out. <clears throat> now the reason I didn't let it out because I know how powerful it is. But, um, and I have been going back and forth with the decision whether I'm going to let it out or not <clears throat> up until this minute. I still may not let it out. <laughs> Maybe it's funny, but you know, it is in a way. I, I, it's, it's just that the decision to do this, okay, is a moral decision. Um, <clears throat> but it's a source of magic. So do you let this out, okay? If I let this out, I have to take the responsibility for what will happen to it. If I keep it, if I keep it back in the house, okay, um, then I may deprive a lot of people 
of this discovery, okay, that farmers, uh, agriculture, the earth, needs, it needs this. And like I've said before, I, I, I don't know if all of you agree with me, but I've always felt that all of this farming that you guys do, and the way you do it, is, is the future of, of, of the human being. <clears throat> so to me, it's not about the vegetables that you raise, or the plants, or the corn, or whatever, whatever you're doing with these plants, <clears throat> to make them more healthy, or to make them grow so that you know they're, they're better for us. That's not the purpose. The real purpose of all this farming and the real purpose of this right here is for the earth. It's not for us and making us healthy. It's to save the earth, which is dying. Now, the earth is dying. But that's what it's supposed to do. It's its, it's, its, it's, its own karma. It's, it's its own destiny that the earth is going to die. We can't stop that. The only thing that we can do is slow it down. Why? So that we can experience more and the people that are coming in so the earth will last longer so they can have the same experience as going through the hardships and the barriers that we have to go through. Because only here can we able, we're able to change ourselves because of the barriers that we have. We don't have any barriers. What are we doing here? If we, have, if we don't have any barriers, we wouldn't come here. We have something to do. And that has both to help people and to help ourselves. So, so based on that, based on that idea, so I've decided to let it out. So I just want you to let it know, it's about 15 years I've been deciding to do this. So anyway, <clears throat> so this is magic, uh, but it's white magic. Uh, it's based on a morality and it's based on the goodness and beauty and wholeness for all of us, okay? Black magic is made about selfishness and immorality. So, I've always been trying to avoid that black magic coming out of my work. I, I, I try, and so what I do, uh, I only will sell these as a unit, okay? I won't sell you the mixer. I will sell you the unit that I know works and what it does. If I sell you just the unit, I don't know what's going to do with it. You, know, you won't know what speed, you won't know what angle, you won't know how deep, you won't know how the size of the volume, everything, and so my helpers, the people who help me, which is Sebastian, and uh, Dean and Stephen and Jordan, wherever Jordan and uh, Jordan, these these are my angels. Yeah, they are my helpers, and I don't. They don't get any money. They don't get any whatever. Any money that comes from the sale of these things, yeah, it goes uh, into our NFT. It, it goes to promoting the work, so more work can be done. Because I have other devices that I can do, that I can bring to the world, but I stopped. I did it for three years and I stopped it going back to art. And the reason I stopped it because I have too much to put to, to give out. I, there's too much. There's, there's not enough people to help. It's, it's just not. So I mean, so why should I keep inventing these things if I can't even get these ones that I got here going? So I dedicated myself to three. I was only dedicated myself to one year to work on this to drop out of the making paintings and sculptures and so forth, to go into a practical application of what I found. Okay, well, it lasted three years. Now it stopped. There's, I don't do this anymore. I do all art now. Okay, so just to give you a background in that why did this take so long, and it does have, a, has, it's patented. So if you buy this device, you're not gonna get somebody else that get, got it cheaper because they made it cheaper. Okay, I have a patent, not a patent pending, a patent. Okay, so the first thing this does is this is a seven-sided form. 
And of course, this is the seven-sided form. It's just edges. And all the surfaces are equal. They're all the same. They're all the same. So they converge, all three here and all three here, into the center. And the center is where this device does something that no other device I've ever seen does. And it's called an implosion. Now, an implosion is uh, very similar to uh, area origin because that's the atomic bomb is based on implosion. Not explosion, but implosion. So this device implodes water. And <clears throat> it it implodes, of course, air, or oxygen, but the part that it really implodes is the etheric. And that's the life force. That's what's going on here in the life force. Now, I want to tell you another thing. You could take anything, this motor, you could take anything and put on it, a spoon, a fork, a couple of chopsticks, and all of them will make a vortex. Every one of them. But the vortex is not enough. You have to have the vortex to do something that they just run down the bottom, make a couple of bubbles. You've got to, this is what this does, is it implodes. So the energy, the vortex comes down and it reaches a certain point, and I'll show you exactly where that point is, and it explodes. Because it can't hold any more etheric. There isn't any, there's nowhere for it to go. It can't go anywhere, and so it implodes out goes to the sides and come back up to the top. And lots of times it goes in the opposite direction than it did when it started. Okay, but the vortex continues to go down to the bottom. So you have a vortex that's this long and it'll close right there. It doesn't destroy the vortex. Now this is a double vortex, this machine here, which we'll start up later, and I'll start this later. But this one here has got two of them running Okay, at right angles. And what these do is when they spin, they create one vortex. And that's pretty cool. <coughs> and they reinforce it. So this baby here is atomic. <laughs> <laughs> and that thing really rocks out. So what I first did was I decided that I wanted to test water. And so I made this. Just a heat gun out of metal. That's all I did. No mixer, nothing. And I took this and I sent it to Imoto. And he was this Japanese guy that studied water with a microscope after it was frozen. And these are the crystal studies um, and the results that, that he, he came back with. Now, one side, I, what I do is I told him to take the vessel, uh, so a vessel of water, and put it in one room, and take the same water and another vessel and put it in another room, but the, uh, in the other room, and put it in this. See that thing there? That's this. And in 24 hours, I told him, I want you to give me the results. So this is the water in the other room. And here's the water that came out of the Chetahedron after 24 hours. Now what is you're looking for here is you're looking for growth. There's four on this side, only one on this side. You're looking for size. You're looking for structure. You're looking for more and larger points because that's where the energy comes out. Energy comes out of the edge, the very point of a crystal. And you want to see how many go into chaos. So the only, the only ones that are, are forming here are these three, these three, what are on these four? Maybe not that one. The rest are in chaos. So those ones that are in chaos cannot hold the energy. But the ones that are well formed and are growing, all of these are growing, okay, is where the accumulation is happening in this form. Now I didn't do anything. There's no mixing, there's nothing. You just put it over the, a glass of water. And that affects the water that you drink. That will have more etheric in it, more life force in it, than if you don't put it in this. 
so anyway, I, I did this many years ago. I, I think I did this like 10 years ago. The guy died, he's, he, he died, I don't know how many years ago. But, uh, and at that time it cost me uh, $750, which was a lot of money at that time I was working on it. But I didn't care, I, I did it. Okay, so there's this. So there is some scientific discovery, some kind, that I tried to apply to this, something. Pretty hard to, to apply the etheric, you know, life force. How, how do you prove it or whatever? You could talk about it. Okay. So, it comes from a seven-sided form, but let me just go, how many people were at the lecture on art that I gave? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, good, that's fine. You'll see something again, but that doesn't hurt you. But I want you to, you know, uh, it's a double tape. Okay, so one of the things I, I start out with is, is this is the compass. It's the one I use all the time. And I say, this is consciousness. This is a form of consciousness here. This allows you to, to become involved in objective thinking because everything this does is lawful everything this does is truth there is nothing false about this nothing so you have any kind of conflict with someone that you see that's untrue and you have to go home and you have to think oh my gosh was that true what that guy said or what was that a bunch of baloney or what okay this will straighten it out <laughs> Those that well, that's gonna work, doesn't it? <laughs> so here we go. It's a compass, huh? We draw the circle. Now that's a compass point. So th th there's all duality, right? Everything's duality. That's why we're here. We have to we have to balance these polarities. <clears throat> so this is a really good way to do that, and that's to take the compass point of each circle and take it out to the periphery, right? So that's Arm and this is Lucifer, if you want to think of it. Okay, so in between these two, this is called the vesica. And this almond shape right here is the balance between those two forces, Aram and Lucifer. And that distance between there and there is known as root three, which is 1.732, and on an endless amount of numbers that never comes to an end. A computer has tried to find this out. It took a one million, two and a half million digits, and they still can't find the end. That's known as sacred geometry. That's where it comes from. It's called sacred because it cannot be duplicated with a ruler or any kind of computer or any kind of measuring device. It's impossible. But I just made it perfect. With this, perfect. That's just so, that's so joyful. <laughs> so what's neat about that is that this is a plane and this is formative forces. Rose Steiner calls this formative forces. Why? Because it, this right here forms forms. This forms all forms. Right here, it shows you. That there is root three, and it makes the third dimensional cube perfect. Now oh, that's amazing. Look at how simple I just told you. Let's just, just brought two circles, and you can create the three dimensional world. And that's how you go from second to third dimension. So to show you in another way is that, you know, the cube is really a hexagram. It's a hexagram. Look at that. It's exciting. So all you do is take root three and you put it in one end and you take the other and stretch it out. There's root. There's the cube. And edges only. That's fantastic. Look at that thing. It's just a bunch of Q-tips. <laughs> All right. So, if we get a little more complex, um, remember every geometric form is trying to become a sphere. No matter what size it is, whatever. It's trying to get to minimum surfaces. <coughs> minimum surfaces means the surface that contains the biggest volume. Okay, what is it? It's a sphere. Well, this is less than the volume of a sphere. So it's trying to get back to its original shape. That's what's happening. And of course, when, in the process of that, all of these start to become curves. 
And what's neat about this tetrahedron, I'll show you this later, but what's really neat about it is that <coughs> it, 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 you just, this is hard to imagine, so this is kind of a, an illustration, but you know, all the lines are straight. Moon curves. And this is an Earth type of uh, uh, study. The next study is water. So I have earth, water, air, and fire. I have found a way to use all four of those in sculpture, or in three dimensions. So how do you make a curve out of a straight line? All I have to do is put it into water, and water is what's changing. So what's changing is you have to make this flow. So if I make this flow, it turns into curves. And those curves make a bell. This is the first geometry ever discovered of where the bell's coming from. Okay, so if I put that chest to Hadrian, okay, like I did here, I use rubber bands to show you that there's two triangles, one here and one here, one bigger than the other. And of course, um, also, you know, the top of this that I'm holding is three kites there, right here. You know, there's three kites in there. One kite, you see what I mean? So if I flip this over, it kind of doesn't fit exactly, but you can see, I left it so you can see that there really is a kite. Yeah? That the, the top of the form is the kite. So where does the kite come from? It comes from a five-pointed star. The basis of this is five points, although it's seven. So the five and the seven, which is 12, there are 12 edges here. So it makes us 12 edges. There's four triangles and three kites. So they're all equal. So if I take this bottom triangle and I bring it up with these rubber bands, <coughs> and I bring the top one down, and I keep moving them down until both of them create the same form. <coughs> and the same form See how I did that? It's a hexagram. It's this. Same form. Except it's flat. It's a plane. Same form. Okay. You know that that makes a cube. I just showed you. Doesn't it? Okay, so... So I made that cube. And when I made it, I found out there was a cube inside this form. There's an actual cube in here. Well, I had no idea. But I was looking for what was in here, because I want to know what's in here. I, I see it's all open, but I knew that all the platonic forms and so forth were solid. And I never accepted that. I never call them platonic saws, I call them open to edges only, so I knew there was something in these forms, I know it. So from this one, I found out that there's a hexagram, of course, and of course that's, that's the Star of David, that's two triangles in opposite directions, some, some people use it for religious, other people use it for meditations, you know, thousands and thousands of years old. But here it is in the middle. Okay, so if I take this apart, I can see the top there is with the copper or the two triangles. And here's another hex. That's not amazing. Now, when I put this together, okay, I'll put it together. Put it back like it was. I meet in the middle. Look at that. Isn't that amazing that those two that I had I put together meet in the middle? But what's really disturbing is this isn't in the middle. This is higher than this. So there's something, either there's something I did wrong or there's something that I don't understand or something I don't like. But I live with it. 
I had a little of it. You can't cheat in geometry. When two lines cross, that's a point. Okay. So I decided, well, let's see. Can I put um, a cube inside the form? So I did. I found there's a cube. And that's geometrically lawfully a cube that comes from the seed of life. You have the flower of life, which is 19 circles, with seven in the middle, and right in the middle of seven is one. If you have a, a real center house, it's, um, it's a first class thing that uh, people go to enjoy. Yeah, That's based on 19 lessons. Let's see where it comes from. It comes from the flower of life. And right in the middle of the flower of life, there's the chestahedron, exactly in the middle. Now, the copper that I have there is just to separate the outer 12 circles. It's not because copper is different than other ones, just to show you. So, that these are similar. This is called, the fruit of life is called, see the flower of life. Here it is, the cube alone in a sphere, in a, in a plate. And I got it, so there's the, there's the six-pointed star. See the six-pointed star? Kind of hard to see, maybe. But it's there, and you can come up and look, you know, and check me out. Make sure that that's really a six-pointed star, and that six-pointed star is in here, too, and there's 12 circles around here. This is amazing that this is happening. So, if I say that, you know, forms are trying to uh, become minimum surfaces, that means that I should be able to take a sphere and put it over the chestahedron. And look at that, it hits the top perfectly, and it, it closes that copper circle, doesn't it? Look at that. And then all the silver, the 12 around it, okay, uh, touch the centers of the other circles, which make up 19 or of the way doing it. So the trouble is, is that, you know, it isn't in the middle. I mean, you know that, that the chest of heat is in the middle. Until I put the other half on it, it's exactly in the middle. The Q is exactly in the middle, which disturbed me for a long time. And the reason that this goes up here is because these three points here, the base, touch the same sphere, half the sphere, as the top. So now it's in the middle. No one knows what to do with the, with the flower of life for uh, 3,000 years. They just keep copying the same thing. They draw the 19 circles and do anything with it. It's a chalk maybe, or they cross the lines, or right? they never become three-dimensional. They have no clue what the third dimension is in. We do now. We don't have to be fooling around with this old stuff anymore, except to learn from it, because that's where you learn from. Okay. So then people say, well, yeah, yeah, he, he made a cube. Yeah, that's right, but, you know, is that really there? Is that thing really there? You know, is that just, you know, his um, you know, astro body? So I knew that. So what I did was I found out that I could do this. I could put it into soap. <laughs> and I get a perfect cube. better for you. Might have to do it again. I will. This is soap out of the bathroom, which isn't really too good. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm pretty sure I can get it. I'll try. It's worth waiting for because it's, there it is right there. But I'll take it away. See if I can get one in the middle. Because I said there was one in the middle, right? And it's just about. Oh. Look, 
the soap is difficult to work with, but that's okay. What happens is the bubbles get on the top and then they want to interfere with what goes inside. But that's okay. I knew I might have trouble because Ah, there it is right there. There it is. No, that's a seven cellular bubble, <laughs> which also comes from this. I want to get the cube. That's a tetrahedron. There's a tetrahedron. So what's um, amazing about this is that I'm able to get some of the platonic forms also out of the seven-sided form. Oh, that's a seven-sided bubble. That's a beauty. There's a cube. Yeah, there's the cube. Now there's a lot of bubbles around it, and I'm going to try to take them away. But I want you to see the cube before I do that, that I'm telling you the truth. So I'm gonna to try to take these bubbles away, but there's the cube right there, sitting exactly where it is in this drawing. Oh, it went away. Did some of you see it? Yes. Yes. All right, see, I'm not lying. <laughs> we saw it the other night, too. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Better bubbles than Do you drop glycerin in the, for some water? Uh, well, well, what's the question? I she just said if you added glycerin, it would have helped. Yes, would have helped. Yes, this is just. See, the thing is, is some some places have the water that they don't put glycerin in, in their soap. Okay, and so it won't blow bubbles good. But the reason they put the glycerin in is there, so you get bubbles. So it seems like your clothes are going to get clean. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't affect it. Doesn't hurt it. I'm mean, doesn't do any good either. Okay, so. All right, so um, I told you I put a, a glass of water in here. Recently, okay, I did something else, and I'm going to show you before I talk about it. But what I did recently was put wine in here. Oh. <laughs> anyway, just, just know this, that I'm not going to tell you about it yet. <clears throat> Now, it, we have a booth, and in the booth, there is a, a notebook that has all the research that um, <clears throat> was done by a, a woman who's a PhD and worked on blood, um, blood um, microscopic studies dealing with cancer. And now she retired, and she decided that she would study with the electronic uh, microscope. Why? So I went to her. And I said, look, I want you to put wine in this one. And I want you to put wine in a, a glass with a mixer. I want another one in a blender. Okay, and another one, done nothing. Just pour it out of the bottle and put it in the glass. Okay, and in the studies that she did, she found out, I'll give you just the, the, the basic found, finding, was that, uh, you guys know what uh, two buck chuck is? You do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all the young people are there, yeah, all right. So. <laughs> um, well, it's not a real expensive wine. It's, you know, it's, anyway. So I asked her to have tasters to come out and see the taste difference between, thanks a lot. Thank you, Stephen. This is the lady's cards, her, her, you know, her business cards, and <clears throat> these are studies of the wine. And there's a crystal structure in water, which is over here. There's also a crystal, a crystal structure in wine. And what she does is study those crystals, and she's found that some crystals uh, indicate that it's bitter, and some are uh, other ones are sweet, 
other ones are sour, and she knows by the configuration of the crystals that she photographs that what the wine should taste like. So here's our here's our crystallization. So this one is with the controls, is the CBO, this is the to heat, and this is the mixer. And so these are all the studies that she does. And she found out from her studies of other wines through the years that this form, okay, causes the wine to age quicker because the crystals that form in real aged wine appear in the Chestahedron's water, or wine, very quickly. So number one, it ages wine quickly. Okay, the second thing is, is that tasters and so forth in the study said that I took the two buck chuck, okay, I put a biodynamic, organic grown wine that cost $75 a bottle. And the tester tasted that, and then tasted the tubak chuck out of here, and the tubak chuck tasted that. So it's another way I try to look at the way that this could be used for everyone, everybody at home. People will drink one or just drink water. This affects the water, and that's just plain water. This will bring the etheric force into water that's gone because it's been filtered. All filtered water, you get all these bottles that you drink, that's vitality, it's gone. As soon as it goes through a filter, it's gone. This puts it back. This doesn't clean water, this vitalizes water. It makes it alive again. So, um, and also, uh, Bastian's been working on uh, how it affects plants, which he will tell you about. Uh, he's also been hired at a nursery. <clears throat> He'll tell you about that experience with this. Um, so this is one, is a gallon and a half. This one is for people at, at one and at home for water. <clears throat> if it's, it's also can be used for wine people, but it takes 10 bottles of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that doesn't bother some people. Okay, so I should start this way. I'll let you, sh let you see. Well, I won't start this one yet, but we'll let you see a vortex is forming, okay? Which, you know, I could use a spoon in here, but it won't implode. So you'll, an implosion is the etheric, okay? So across from the etheric, okay, water, also there's sound ether, right? You know that? Across the, 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 the etheric side of the physical form or uh, element, okay, is water, the other side is sound etheric, okay? I don't know if you know that. So this makes a sound that you've never heard before. And it does it in a rhythm. So it's not going It's not like that. It's got its own rhythm. Like has nothing to do with the speed, has nothing to do with the size, it has nothing to do with the liquid, has nothing to do with us. It's just on its own. Okay, so here we go. See how long it takes to get going here. There it goes. Uh, and you'll be able to hear the implosion, and you'll also be able to hear or see the vortex that will be formed. Implosion. It can't hold any more there. So it bursts out. And why it can't hold it? Because it can't get any bigger than that cube. The implosion is happening in this cube, inside this gestahedron. That cube. Now, a regular fork or a regular mixer or whatever you got at home or whatever, it won't implode. Nothing will implode. Very it's not being insensitive to the water. It's doing its own thing. Now it depends. You can make it go faster, you can make it slower, you can make it bigger, whatever. I have CBOs 
That's called a vortex, it's called a chestahedron, or a chesta vortex organizer. This organizes the structure of the water because you don't change the structure of the water just by a vortex. You have to put the, the water into chaos. That is chaos. That is, I can't do anything else but uh, go somewhere else. And to bring in the etheric, what well, holds it like it until it can't stand anymore and there's so much in there. Then it goes into chaos and then it reorganizes itself, okay, back into the vortex. And you can see that sometimes the vortex is, you know, just right. Like there, then there's a, there's a book. Well, why does it do that? It's based on seven. It's not based on an, on an even number. So this is for a uh, fine call. This is now, this very minute, is being used to mix medicines at Uriel Pharmacy. Right now. Except this is made of glass, Pyrex, not plastic. The reason I use this plastic like this is so we could see it. Yeah? But they also want to see it. But of course Pyrex is, is really great. This is also plastic, uh, it's so you can see it. But I don't recommend that the CBO be used in plastic. It should be used in a metal. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, no, I'm not going to start this one at all. Not until he's done. So basically, I'm done. Okay, and Sebastian's going to tell you what this is doing. What experience has he had with this thing? But, of course, I can tell you, he's dealing with thousands of dollars. All right, Sebastian, do you want me to turn this off or do you want me to leave it on? Oh, we can turn it off for now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So three years ago, I, uh, I was able to reconnect with Frank and ask him about, do you have someone working with your CBO? because I'd known about it for a while. And it just happened that the person was not able to carry the research anymore, so I was really glad. And I moved to Santa Cruz, and it just happened that my brother-in-law had a big, great garden, and it was all cover crop, and there was all these beds waiting for something to happen. And I seized my chance, and I decided to see what if I split a bed in two, had about like 60 feet, so 30 feet on either side, and I decided to see, let's start with some roots. So I planted some carrots, some beets. And I wanted to see, okay, what does it do something to the leaf more? So I did cabbage, chard, kale, and some lettuces. Also some basil, some herbs. And I also went for broccoli, cauliflower, and some tomatillos. And my goal was to see if the forces coming out of this form influence more one aspect of the plant or another. Is it more grounding the plant? Is it more, as we know, and biodynamic, something that has more to do with the orn manure and helps the plant really connect to the earth and have the root system more enlivened? Or is it more like bringing the fruiting system and the flowering, the, the taste? And So that was my question to begin with. And we, I began first with wheatgrass, just to see. I run for six months. I did different batch of wheatgrass, just trays, and doing both sides. And I brought them to the center a couple of times. So, so how are you using the mixed water? So I would mix the water for about five to 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, just similar in a little ball, just like that. And at that time I had a drill that was set up at the angle and just run it for five to 10 minutes. And then it was a bigger ball because the beds were pretty big, but it was a lot of watering. But that basically water with the same water to begin with from the well of our property. And one was stirred and one was unstirred and I 
went like that for two seasons. And right away, even in two weeks, what we noticed with the wheatgrass is when we took them out and look, the root lists were totally different, much more ramified. And we have pictures you can come and see in our brochure that it really helps the root just have a lot. And we know that the little rootlets are the one going for the nutrients. So I was very interested. And the green of the wheatgrass, you could tell anyone I brought, I said, which one do you want to drink out of? And it was like, this one. The green was much more vital and clear. And the juice, the wheatgrass juice that we made out of it was much sweeter. So that was just the beginning. So then the crop, we wanted to be a little bit more scientific about it. And so we found a lab in the Netherlands who's found a way to extract the sap of the leaf, the young leaf and the old leaf. And without breaking the cell walls, just as the sap that's going to the cell, it's a bit like a blood test, because if I take the whole leaf and I crush it and analyze, of course I'll found, let's say, calcium in it. But the question, was there calcium coming to feed the cell, or was it just a structure? Like if I cut my hands, yes, I have a bone, but it's locked in. It's not available for feeding the living moment. So that lab found a way to extract it, a cold extraction, and then we get to see what's coming to. And by the new leaf, the newest leaf, that's the beauty of nature. Any living organism will send the best it has to its young. We know in mothers, in cows, they will, it's going to pull out of their horns, pull out of everywhere to give to the baby, the baby coming. So when you analyze the new leaf, you get to know what the best coming out of the soil would get to the plant. And in the old leaf, then we know that that can use as storage. Some elements can move and be stored there or be used somewhere else. So the old leaves start losing their green. And so by looking at the young and the old, we see what's available if the plant is deficient in something. So if the young leaf don't have a whole lot of iron or something, you know it's just not available in the soil. And what we found out is that the plant that had received the water that had been oxygenated and stirred, were, the root were bigger, the leaf were fuller, and the flavors were definitely in ants. And when we did the sap analysis, we could see that even though they had the same amount of nutrients coming to them, the way the plant uses them was more intelligent, one you might say. It was the same soil, same cover crop, but the plant were able to do better with what they had. The life force that they received through the water allowed the plant to shape, to organize what was coming to it and produce like the best carrot possible. So we had carrots that were much more flavorful. We had basil where the essential oil were totally different in the same growing soil. So that was very interesting. We have a little bit more of the, if you want to know the exact numbers, we have some of the sheets you can come and look. And that led us to want to go, okay, could we go a little bit further? So just water stirred with that created a plant that almost had received like some 500 and from silica. Both of them seemed to be strengthened. The flavors were more refined and the root were actually more in tune with the soil and better spread out. And that's when we, I had a friend who worked at a big nursery in Watsonville, in Watsonville, California. It's at 80 acres. They produce for a lot of the West Coast. To give you a picture, the pot plants about 40 to 30,000 plants a day that they ship. So it's a production. They start the little sprout, and in one day, they have the machines and are about 80 acres filled. It's kind of a strange sight because you just see gravel everywhere, just plants, plants, plants. And in those contexts, it's the most difficult for plants to thrive because you have 20 to you have like 2,000 different species all together, same watering, same 
soil, which is not really soil, but one of the most problematic situation. So we have tons of chemicals, tons of disease. The University of Berkeley comes there to send their PhD to study and find new disease. They're very excited. That's the type of place. And my friend got hired there. He's a farm, biodynamic farmer and said, you know, let's bring the CVO, let's start stirring, and let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens, and we'll stir the biodynamic preparation. So we have both, obviously the biodynamic preparation coming onto the ground, but then we, we started stirring gently by hand, and I was with my little backpack sprayer going over my 80 acres <laughs> for eight hours a day, once a week, I would go and spray. And after a month, all the employees started noticing the plant looked different. So then I was glad, next month they started sending me help. <laughs> and we started getting more organized. And three months later, everyone could see that the whole nursery was starting to look entirely different, less disease. And we started lowering a lot, all the sprays of chemicals. And after three months, we were able to, they were so, in tune seeing the difference that after three months we had the tractor going, they had all the equipment, and we were stirring 4,000 gallons of BB prep a week over the, the place. And obviously we had also to deal with, you know, the fight of the old world. Our organic, they would just, oh, we saw something, and they would spray their stuff on top of all our, you know, biodynamically sprayed. But, you know, here's 25 of habits of putting chemicals. And if it sees something that looks a bit strange, it just spray everything. Even with the chemicals sprayed on top of what we did, after a year, disease was down 80%. Wow. And the chemical company started harassing us because they didn't know why we were, the, the sales had dropped 80,000 <laughs> in six months. And they were like, what are you doing? And starting harassing the employee working with me because they weren't buying more chemicals. Uh, just to be careful, you were spraying the, the preps stirred through the through this or just stirred? Well, we started with the, with the CVO. So what we with did, we started by hand in a 55 gallon. And then I had a, a little bit more, it's like 85 gallon, and then I, we had a 1,000 gallon tank, and we would start with a big CVO in the tank for an hour and then bring it into the field. So that would do your stirring for you? Yes, so I, I, did the first, I did the first part by hand, the first hour by hand, out of principle. I love the part that the human being plays also as consciousness, but when you have a 1,000 gallon, uh, it's a lot of work and people just don't want to do it. But at least to do the first part by hand and then to homeopathically grow it 10 times into the big tank. And we saw that the potentizing done through the CVO is, works very well. There's no question. The result continue to be... Yeah. We have a... Yeah. You can see kind of a big tank, and we just have a motor on top coming at an angle with the CVO in there. So it doesn't have to be uh, cylindrical, mm -hmm. I mean uh, a sphere. No, okay. not exactly. We, we had also a sphere. We found a 1,000 gallon sphere, and that was our beginning. And then we needed more, so we bought just a, we start trying in that, and even this one was working. And we have a vortex six feet down going, mm -hmm. and you know that sounds of sucking life and uh, everyone coming. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes. Do you find a pressure drop or a temperature drop when you're stirring water? I haven't noticed uh, those elements as far as the pressure. I haven't. I don't know how I would check that necessarily. What I, I what I did notice is that when the CVO goes through the implosion, what we get when we stirred, when we stir by hand, usually around the, you know, half hour, the water is totally different. You can see the reflection of the sky, the viscosity, everything start. There's a real shift. And obviously, if you go very rigorously, you can happen it in 10 minutes. But usually, if you have a big quantity and you do it by hand, it takes a certain time where the shift happens. And with the CVO, it happens really quick. And I started even mixing with the CVO first, 
and then do it by hands and it's so much easier. Everyone knows that after like the last minute when you get tired, you think I'll never make it, but you just go a few times and the water just whoo, start going. There's kind of this, wow. it's easier to flow. And so the, the water start have this fluidity to it. Can you share about how the oxygen level changes in yeah. time? So part of it also is that when the CVO brings the implosion, we have oxygen coming in. So we have the dissolved oxygen in the water being going to 100% very fast. So the maximum dissolved oxygen, because every, depending on the temperature of the water, the, the water is able to hold within it as dissolved oxygen a higher rate or lower rate. The colder it is, the more it can hold oxygen. But this will bring any water to this maximum potential of oxygen in five minutes or ten minutes. It's a very quick process of transformation. Have you ever bathed in it? Excuse me? Have you ever taken a bath in it? No, I haven't. <laughs> but it, we drink more. Yeah, we, we have. And anyone, I tested many people, blind eyes and thing, and it does change even the, the texture of the water. It's softer. And it has, when you take it, just that quality of freshness, of light. I mean, it's the difference between if you get to go to a spring and you drink water, it's like, ah, oh, that quality of this, this is alive, or if it's been sitting a bit too long in the bottle. So it's almost like the, a similar process happens as if a waterfall happens, a water crashing, many vortex, and bringing this white water quality. Yes? Is there any shelf life on the kid after you um, vortexing, is it day or yeah. Last so we did a bit of test on that, and I, I tried with wheatgrass again, like letting it sit for three days, seven days, and out of like after five days, I could still see that the water was better, and after that, it was less clear. So I was not sure. It, it gets harder to see how long it tests. But we we like we brought the dissolved oxygen on big tanks, like a 2,500 gallon tanks, and a week later it was still at 100%, which usually when it gets cooked in, the, in the, the heat of the summer, it kind of like drops more and more. But yes. what about the amount of water? Is it using less water? Is it, can you conceive water when you're planting as the enlivened water as opposed to Irrigation. That's a very excellent question. What, it was great. We went on a vacation and we, we couldn't water anything. And when we came back, our wheat grass was totally dead and the one with the severe was still green. So it's interesting. Partly also, the rootlets are like little sponge. So if they have more of them, they have more capacity to absorb the water and to keep it. And because the water has been stirred, this, I think it's more available to the plant. So I did also test on some of the beds and water less, and I would get the plant were still nicer than the one who received more water. So it's hard to bring, like my best sense is like I dropped the water about 30%, and it would still get better result. Have you tested in relation to phases of the moon? No, not so much, none of that. Yeah, if, if it helps in that way, I have not, yeah. So it is, you know, what, what is going on in, with the CVO, with this form? Out of the research we've done thus far, it's clear that I had the chance to, to roll one like that in the dust my house when the sun peeks through and you get to see all the particles mm -hmm. and I was turning it I really wanted to see because it's so fast what the heck is going on and I was turning it in the dust very gently and way over there you could see suddenly the dust just start Ooh. vortexing and coming all the way in uh. to the center uh -huh. like from the other side of the room it was like it was amazing like, wow this really sucks 
I was like, impressive. And then it, there's a real suction coming in. <laughs> and at the same time, I started noticing on my right, there was another vortex coming from the other side. So there's a vortex coming this way and another one coming this way and just trying to come in in that little corner here and the two of them meet. So there's two vortex coming from two direction and meeting. A new kind of vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and then the, the force you could sell is, is sent at the periphery around. So there's a real direction. And when we think of the plant, it's very interesting that here we have one who could say this these triangle, that tetrahedron, which is known as fire in the old ancient world, the will element, the warmth of the world, the womb out of which all things came from, opens up to receive what? The five-pointed star. To receive this contracting five-pointed star. And this balance of the will and of like the perfect form. This more this the star that each of us has. That we could say like in our heart, we have this connection, this perfect balance between you know all the things we know and the things in our will that we don't know yet, that are just keeping us going in life we don't even know why. And bring into balance this will of the earth and this wisdom of the cosmos meeting. There's something there that allows for the right, I would say, unity of heaven and earth, of what's the right archetype of a carrot, and what brings the most out of like the ground out of which the carrot can grow. And I've found like it, it allows, it creates a space where those are welcome. Where the star of the carrot or the star of the broccoli, like its genius is welcome in onto this earth. And the, the earth is actually enlivened and lifted up so that it's malleable enough to listen to this archetype. And that's this form of the heart that brings healing when we're a bit too much on our head or when we're too us in chaos and don't know where we're going anymore. To find that balance where our true life's task or our genius can shine. I've seen the plants shine and at the nursery where we work, I saw the human being start to shine. It's about 80 employees, most of them Latinos, who've been working their butt off for years, still at minimum salary. Most of their friends are dying around 50 of cancer because of chemicals poisoning. And when we showed up, one of them at some point, they laugh at us, they made fun of us, and at some point one of the employee said, you know, I hope it works because I'm tired to see all my friends die. And I know those chemicals do not work because it's millions of plants I've seen died in front of my eyes. And my parents, they planted by the moon and their plants are healthy. And after a while, it's the social, the dynamic that started opening, the heart starting to see each other, human destiny. And to me, that was like kind of the bigger gift that when the biodynamic helps the earth and it helps us reconnect with each other and that ultimately this technology heals not just the earth but the human being. And that's, we are the greatest technology. And obviously, our understanding of this form, if you bring that with you, you have this form in you, in your heart. And it's not that you need the device, but there's a device that has come forward to help us understand, I think, 
the white magic that human being can do also inwardly and I'd like to thank Frank and come back with us to, because he's helping us reconnect to what the human being is capable of Thank you, sir. There's a book on my um, <coughs> booth, and it's called uh, Cosmic Heart. Or Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. Yeah, yeah. So, who, yeah you, you, you have the book. <laughs> I read well, it on the airplane, not knowing that you would be. I just got it two days ago. <laughs> There it is. And uh, the front cover is my work that, that I put together for my, my study. And inside it, there's a chapter based on the geometry of the human heart. Well, this doctor came to my lecture, and he said, my gosh, he says, I want to write a book with you. I said, well, I'm already. But <clears throat> so I am, I approached the Steiner Press, and they want the book. What, what the book is all about is that <clears throat> this is the geometry of the left ventricle of the human heart. I proved it. And he wrote a whole chapter on the research that I did. And there's four pictures of there of the chestahedron and the chestahedron in the cube, which sits at 36 degrees, which is the angle of the heart. Okay? And the heart was designed basically from the cube. Cube is not there anymore. And of course, it's not all angular structure like this. So if I put this in the minimum surfaces, it's exactly the right ventricle. So I did all these kind of studies about the heart, and I found out that the heart and this this chestahedron, when it goes back to the cube, is because of congestive heart failure. So now I have found out the actual geometry of heart disease, so that you can see what stage a heart disease is. The heart is in by its form. So form has a function, function has a form. I love to say that's my thing, but it's true. Now the left ventricle, okay, is this shape. On the right, it's not, it's collapsed. It's this collapsed. I've taken this form and I've made them, and I've poured sand into this one, and then pour it out, take the sand in the other one, which is wrapped around this one, it hugs this one, it loves it, holds the same amount of sand. So I found all kinds of things about how the heart works that no one knew, because no one had the geometry. The geometry tells you the form and what the form does. So the heart, when it, when it, the heart goes like this and this and this and this and this and this, and I've got models that show how that works. And the blood goes down to the apex, this is called the apex, and this is called the base. The blood goes down to the apex in a vortex, this one, okay, and it gets, it doesn't get down to the bottom. Because this is paper thin down here, or one skin thick. This is seven layers, isn't that interesting? Seven layers around the heart, which is very thick. And the reason that doesn't get down there, no one knows. They can't understand why the heart doesn't blow out, because this vortex comes in and one third of a second and doesn't get down here and blow out with one layer. And why? Because this shape right here, when it spins, it turns into a circle. And that circle is the size of the micro valve. And so that when a vortex comes in here, it can't get all the way down here because it hits these wires or this form. Now they know why it doesn't blow out. So they know if the micro valve is getting too big, from congestive heart failure, then it's going to make this bigger, and this is going to start to go in deeper and start to blow out. And that, there's a whole bunch of studies in Japan that this is happening to some of the women in Japan. <laughs> this is blowing out. So, just to give you an indication of why this may work like it is, is it's not like putting a spoon on there or a fork or anything else. This is different. Now, so Sebastian was talking about these two vortexes. It's true. So, this is called research. 
but to put it together, it's called spiritual research, spiritual science. That's what this is, is spiritual science. I really started said you need to do, because this is dealing with what you can't see, scientific. You can't see the cube in there, as I showed you. You can't see the cube in there. Where is it? But it's there. So this is the study of the unseen spirit and the science. And that's what this is all about. I never, listen, my intention was to find a seven-sided form. I had no clue I would be ever even interested in a mixer or water or anything else. This is not an intention. This is a result of what, something that came to me. Now, Sebastian will turn this baby on over here. <laughs> so you probably want to get out of your seats or either, either that or put your safety belts on. <laughs> Question. No, I only got a question. If we, if we sit down after we look at this, we can, I can answer a few questions. That's supporting yeah. 30 gallons. Yeah. And the reason that's done that is so it doesn't touch the earth. We want it to be more suspended, like a mistletoe. Okay. So, but you still have the swimming inside. Inside this. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. 